during which we will have the opportunity to show our respects for His Royal Highness Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh. We remember especially at this time Her Majesty the Queen and the members of the Royal Family. So in our prayers later in our service, we will offer thanks for Prince Philip's life and also bring his family before God. On this, the second Sunday of Easter, we open very appropriately with the Easter greeting. Alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. You're all very welcome this morning to this service in St. Colmenelles, whether you're joining with us physically in the church building or taking part in the worship virtually at home. You're very welcome indeed. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to meet in your presence. Be with us during our time of worship. Guide all of our thoughts as we offer our praise and our thanks for all your goodness. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And our opening hymn this morning is hymn number 583, Jesu, my Lord, my God, my all.
few words of introduction. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. And so we move to our time of confession. The doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. In this Easter season, we bring our failings to Almighty God as together we say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins and serve you with a quiet mind through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And our collect for today. Almighty Father, you have given your only Son to die for our sins and to rise again for our justification. Grant us so to put away the leaven of malice and wickedness that we may always serve you in pureness of living and truth through the merits of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our reading for this morning is taken from the first letter of St. Peter, from the first chapter beginning to read at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. I'm sure many of you will know well the story recounted by Richard Buys in his book, The Resurrection, Fact or Fiction. He tells of an encounter that he once had with a taxi driver. It's a story that I really like and one which I often return to at this particular time of the year. I quote from the opening lines of Buys' book. I feel sorry for you Christians 
said the taxi driver over his shoulder, seeing my clerical collar. I have to say he looked anything but sorry. His shoulders were shaking with laughter. There you all are, he went on. You pin everything on your belief in an afterlife. You work, you pray, you give up everything. And then when you get to the end, you will discover that there is nothing there at all. I laugh too, said Buse. It seemed like the right thing to do. That's all very well, I said, but supposing I am wrong, supposing there is no heaven, supposing there is no judgment, supposing there is no afterlife or anything like that, even so, I still win. Here I am, deluded, making my way through life, firm in my conviction that life is not the product of mere chance. I believe with millions of others that we are in this world for a purpose and that a man called Jesus Christ has beaten back death on behalf of us all. In my delusion, I am fired and motivated by the sense of his living presence with me every single day. So when I come to the end of my days here on earth, I go out into eternity, believing that my energies have all been spent for a lasting purpose. And then, well then, if you are right, I won't even have the disappointment of knowing that I was wrong. But you, I continued, uh, by the way, Buse was warming to the discussion by this stage. Supposing you're wrong, and supposing I am right. There you are, struggling to make a living and to earn enough money to keep yourself together, and you don't even know why. You try to make a sense of existence, living life off your own batteries, and hoping for the best. You fight off illness and decay for as long as you possibly can. But in the end, you have to accept that you must die. And then, well then you're in for the most terrible shock. You will find yourself confronted by the very person you have ignored all of your life. You will have to realize that everything you have been living for was wasted. It has all been for nothing. Now, just supposing, but the taxi driver wasn't listening anymore. He was busy doing a U-turn in the middle of the road. If only he could have done the same thing with his thinking. If only. I'm sure you all realize that so many people today seem to take the attitude of the taxi driver in our story. People who, for one reason or another, fail to recognize the earth-shattering significance of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, for those needing to be convinced, there are plenty of reasoned arguments. The fact is, there is only one explanation for the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it explains the empty tomb. The fact is that at least 10 post-resurrection appearances are recorded, some involving as many as 500 witnesses. The fact is that the disciples became new people as a result of the resurrection of their master. The world of Judaism, the world of Greek thought, the world of Roman imperialism, none would have known anything about Jesus Christ had it not been for the disciples who had been transformed. It was his followers who were to carry the message. As we all know, Christianity went on to outgrow Judaism, to outgrow Greek culture and outgrow Roman imperialism. Who can possibly therefore doubt the fact of the resurrection? Only a fool. Who can possibly ignore the resurrection? 
only a fool. Yet millions today still do not recognize the compelling need to take careful note of the events of that first Easter day. For Christians, the resurrection is more than a distant hope. It is an ever-present reality, for Christians are raised with Christ. As Christians, the resurrection, if it means anything at all, must mean certain things for each of our lives. Firstly, we must take a different attitude to life. And we must live at a different altitude. We must seek the things which are above where Christ is. We must seek by prayer and help from God to live with and rise above the pressures of everyday life. Secondly, we must see things in a different way. We must, as Paul reminds us, set our minds on things that are above rather than what is on earth. It is the dimension of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives purpose, direction, and meaning to life on earth. And thirdly, we need to grow in a different environment. We must put the past behind us. As a result of the resurrection, we are offered new life, eternal life, a life that will last forever. The book of Proverbs puts it very vividly. The road the righteous travel is like the sunrise, getting brighter and brighter until the daylight has come. Take a different attitude to life. See things in a different way. Grow in a different environment. Perhaps we all need to recognize that there comes a point when we need to make a U-turn in our lives and in our attitudes. The resurrection of Jesus gives us all new hope, hope for the future, a hope that no one can take away from us. He did rise again. His resurrection is a real, undisputable historical fact, we too have an opportunity to rise to new life, if but only if we put our trust in him. As we heard in our reading this morning, although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In this Easter season, as we celebrate his resurrection, may we now all be fired and motivated by the sense of his living presence with us every single day of our lives. Amen. We have sung of our faith, we have confessed our sins, we have listened to and we have contemplated God's word. And now we take the opportunity to affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. As together we say, I believe in God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son or Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now we come to our time of prayer. Let us pray.
And at this time, we pray for our province during this time of danger. We would ask that God would guide our political community and church leaders to do and say what is appropriate in the present circumstances. We continue to pray for all those impacted by the ongoing pandemic. We think of those who are ill at home, in hospital, in nursing or residential care. And we pray also for those who have responsibility for their care, all health workers, doctors, nurses, care assistants. We give thanks also for the miraculous work of scientists and researchers for what they have achieved in developing vaccines so quickly and in their ongoing development of those vaccines. We pray too for those who have recently been bereaved. We remember all those who have died as a result of COVID-19. We pray for all those who at this time have responsibility for decision-making with regard to the easing of the lockdown arrangements. We would ask that the Lord would give wisdom and discernment to our government and public officials as they determine how best to move forward. And we would ask that we too would pay attention to the guidance that is issued to us. And we pray for our families at this time. We think of our young people who will be returning to school tomorrow and ask for God's guidance and protection for them and for those with responsibility for their ongoing education. We think of all those who are ill at home or in hospital, those who are preparing to go into hospital for surgery or any kind of treatment or assessment. We pray for all those who have recently been bereaved from our parish. And today in particular, we remember the royal family. And as we enter into a time of prayer for them, we take the opportunity to observe a few moments of silence as we reflect on the life and witness of His Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh. Remember, O Lord, your servant Philip, who has gone before us with the sign of faith and now rests in the sleep of peace. According to your promises, grant to him and to all those who rest in Christ refreshment, light, and peace through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. Most merciful God, whose wisdom is beyond our understanding, surround Her Majesty the Queen and the members of the royal family with your love, that they may not be overwhelmed by their loss, but have confidence in your goodness and strength to meet the days to come. We ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as we move to a litany of thanksgiving, the response to let us bless the Lord are the words, Thanks be to God. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we mourn the death of Prince Philip, let us give thanks to God in faith and trust for the gift of Jesus Christ and for all whose devotion to him has sustained the life of our church and nation. Let us bless the Lord. For our Sovereign Lady Queen Elizabeth, 
his late Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, and all the royal family, for the ministers of the Crown, and for all who bear the privilege and burden of government. Let us bless the Lord. For all people touched by the Duke of Edinburgh's devotion to public service, let us bless the Lord. For our own lives, giving thanks for all who have gone before and asking that we might go forward with confidence and hope, let us bless the Lord. O God, in whom we live and move and have our being, grant that your goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, that we may ever trust in your unfailing love, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we bring our time of prayer to an end, so we say, God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest, to the church, the queen, the commonwealth, and all humankind, peace and concord, and to us and all his servants, life everlasting, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And a final blessing. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of the Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among us and remain with us always. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 224, 224, How Deep the Father's Love for Us.
you all for joining in this act of worship this morning. And as our service comes to a close, may we each and every one remember just how deep the Father's love is for us. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.